Merry Christmas. Have you ever given a gift that you knew it just landed, like it made you the hero of Christmas? <laughs> and then have you ever given a gift where you're like, I don't even know if that touched the runway. One Christmas I gave a gift that I was just sure was going to land. The summer before Christmas, we had gone on a road trip together to Glacier National Park in Montana. We had the best time. And so for Christmas, I got the idea of putting a photo book together to give to my kids so they could remember that trip forever. I, I piled and, and worked on the photos and looked at uh, book templates and everything, and I spent hours putting this book together, then I neatly wrapped it, placed it under the tree, just sure I was going to be crowned the hero of Christmas with like a scepter and a goblet full of eggnog and a throne for me to sit on. And my daughter goes underneath the tree, and she opens it up, and I'm waiting. And when she opens and see what it is, she simply just says, oh, cool, thanks, Daddy. Doesn't even crack the cover, hand, turns and hands it to my wife, and, and I look over at her as she gives me the warmest look as she's looking at the book, thinking, this was so thoughtful. As I snap my head back to see my daughter, she's already dove under the tree, pulling out another gift, pulling the wrapper off of it. I think I saw a little bit of a foam in the corner of her lips as she's like, peasants, peasants. And she's diving into this gift and she wraps it up to reveal a small collection of tiny plastic miniature household items like tiny sofas and little floor lamps and plastic spatulas and kitchen mixers. And she snaps her head around to me and says, thank you, daddy, and runs over and dives and gives me the biggest hug. And as she's obnoxiously hanging there on my neck, I look over to my wife with the seriously kind of look as my wife just warmingly gives me Christmas cheer and just says, I love you dearly with that look that she can give you. And I'm sitting there, seriously, a, a tiny plastic couch, a little floor lamp. You're not even going to remember that floor lamp exists on New Year's Day. This trip you're going to remember forever, forever. Come on. You know how many hours I spent after the family went to bed pooling over photos and, and putting that thing together? She's not going to remember anything about those gifts. This one she's going to remember forever. And then I let my grinchy color skin kind of return back to its normal hue. I take a couple deep breaths and we get back to Christmas. Because I realize after all, she's only four. <laughs> and one day I know She'll appreciate it. One day she'll appreciate the work that went into that book. Maybe even it'll take when she's a mom and she has kids of her own. And she'll all of a sudden put memories together for her kids and remember, wow, my dad did that for us. Or maybe she's taking her family on their first road trip and realizing, my parents went to all this work, spent all this time and this money so we could have these memories, these experiences. She'll, she'll appreciate it one day. And you know, as I think about that story, I'm reminded that generosity, the act of giving, there's a cost to it. There's a great cost to giving. I mean, we all want to be generous, but maybe most of us think, I don't think I even have the resources to really be generous, or at least to be as generous as I, as I want to. Or maybe we lose sight of what's really important because we get distracted by getting. One of our elders was asked this week what they thought was the most crucial thing the church could do for the gospel's sake. And they said one word, 
generosity. They said, the world is all about getting, but the gospel tells us to give. You see, one way we can get stuck sometimes in this getting kind of cul-de-sac, in this getting cycle of life, is we can actually think religion is the right answer in order for us to be able to live a generous life. The only problem is, many times religion refers to giving as kind of more like a tax. You know, the premise of a tax is if I give something, I'm going to get something in return, or my community is going to get something in return. There's a, there's a benefit to it. There's a return on my investment. And that's kind of why I lost some, some people don't even like taxes, right? Because they're like, I don't feel like I'm personally benefiting from the money that I'm putting into the system. But there is this kind of getting that's involved when we kind of think about giving as, as a tax. The other thing is, when we think about generosity as a tax, it kind of becomes more of a, a routine. We kind of begin to live out of obligation. And a life that's lived out of obligation is a life that doesn't really have much joy at all. And God wants us to be a giver that's full of joy. He calls us to be joyful givers and to live into generosity. I mean, instead of thinking giving like a tax, maybe we could think of, look at all the great generous things God has given to me. How about I live on the majority of that? Instead of looking at it as a tax, maybe I could say, what if I live like on 90? Like 90% of all the good things that our generous God has given me, what if I lived on 90 and got to give the rest away? But instead of thinking that way, we can get stuck in a religious kind of path that tells us generosity is an obligation. And that just lacks joy. One of the other things we get stuck in is we get stuck in consumerism. Consumerism is all about getting. Consumerism is looking at everything like a commodity. All my possessions are something that I can consume. It's, it's something that I can get. And the only problem is, is when you begin to look at everything in your life as a commodity, eventually you'll look at the people around you and the people you love as commodities as well. And then all you begin to look at in those relationships is what can I get out of someone? What can I get out of them? What can I get out of them? And that leads our relationships in a very shallow and dark place. And we can find ourselves alone and isolated. Getting stuck in consumerism begins to trap us, snare us, begins to imprison us, and we lose the freedom we once had. The freedom that God wants us to live into, the freedom that says, I've been given so much good, how about I give good away? Living into that generosity is what God has called us to. You see, religion says get, consumerism says get, but what does the gospel say? The gospel says give. This is the Jesus way of generosity. Today we're going to take a look at a story where Jesus points out one of the greatest acts of generosity in the Gospels. What does generosity look like? Well, in Luke 21, Jesus says that it looks like a widow. In Luke 21, the story goes like this. When Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. So you see in the temple, there were 13 collection boxes, and they were shaped like shofars. A shofar is like a musical instrument that's made out of the horn of a ram. And it's kind of like a trumpet. And they made these collection boxes to look like a shofar. On the one end was a small opening where you could drop coins in, and the other end was a larger opening that the priest could collect all of the offerings. And the way that the boxes were designed is to give a large gift of coins would have created a loud sound for everyone to hear in the temple. Like, I'm dropping my coins in, listen to how generous I am. <laughs> And in the verses just before this story, Luke records Jesus calling out the religious leaders for cheating widows. And in this story, the widow is made the hero by Jesus pointing her out. And while the widow gives much less, it costs her far much more, which is what Jesus is choosing to point out in this example. You see, Luke is pointing out to the reader that the way Jesus measures faith has nothing to do with religious acts, but sacrificial love. 
I love what Anne Frank says. She says, no one has ever become poor by giving. Do you remember that, that moment when Christmas became less about receiving and more about giving? I mean, there should be a time where that switch gets flipped and all of a sudden it becomes more about what I can give to the people around me than what I can receive from them. And there should be an age in life where we begin to think about, maybe I should be generous and how generous could I be in my life? And it seems like generosity is a massive trend in our world right now, isn't it? I mean, buy a pair of shoes, give a pair of shoes. Get some new glasses, Give away some glasses. I recently saw a commercial about these two guys who made cashmere sweaters, and in doing so, they made a massive difference for a bunch of kids in Mongolia. How cool is that? But what if I were to tell you generosity is not just a current trend? Even further, what if generosity weren't just some ancient practice? What if it were the very fabric of humanity? What if it was a part of our DNA as humans, as, as our DNA of Christ followers, to be as generous as possible. I mean, think about it. The reason why we live out generosity is because why? It's because God was generous. God is a generous God. How generous, you might ask? Well, let me put it this way. Why do we celebrate Christmas? It's because of God's generosity. Generosity comes out of Jesus his gift to us, that God said, I'm going to send Christ to redeem all things. And because of that great generosity, our lives are compelled then to live out generosity in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in the world. But some of us might be asking, how do people even decide to give and where do they decide to give it? I mean, Seems like people give to organizations and maybe it's because they believe in what that organization does or maybe people's hearts are or, you know, pulled with compassion because of the great needs around the world. Maybe some of you grew up in a family that taught you you're supposed to give. And maybe even some of you have this view of money where you're like, I think money's evil, so I just want to give away as much of it as possible. There are many voices and experts that tell us what generosity is and how we should give. In fact, the University of Notre Dame has a Science of Generosity initiative where they look at all of the different ways around the world that people give and the impact it has on humanity and society. Isn't that credible? Uh, but here's what we see from the teachings of Jesus. Jesus' teachings were very simple. In fact, they were so simple, they seemed to confuse people. Like there were so many times where Jesus, Jesus would take this broad idea and say it such in, a, in such a simple way that people would go, huh? You know, like that German shepherd, tilted head, ears down kind of look of like, I, I, uh-huh? I don't quite get what you're saying. Jesus had this profound way of taking this broad idea and not getting trapped in the minutia of the idea, but staying at the massive, bigger, broader level of it. And Jesus had this way of always getting to one issue. It always seemed like one issue. It's the issue of the heart. Jesus was always saying, I want to talk about the heart. And when Jesus talks about the heart, he's really talking about motivation. What is your motive behind your actions. When Jesus points out the, the widow in the temple, he isn't diving into the particulars of giving and how to give. What is he really pointing out? He's pointing out the widow's heart. He's pointing out the motive behind her gift, the heart behind the giver. You see, heart wins the day every time. Heart eats action for breakfast every single morning. I can remember driving around Seattle with my mom when I was in college, and we came to a, a certain stop in the city, and right there was a man with a cardboard sign. My mom immediately reached into her purse, grabbed a significant amount of money, rolled down her window, and gave it to the man. This was not like jingle money. It was like money you could fold. Like She gave him a significant amount of money, and as she rolled up her window and drove away, I proceeded to tell her that, Mom, I recently took a class in college where the professor said it's much more wise to give your money to an organization who will know what to do with that money. They'll be able to provide better resources and programming for people like that. And on top of that, Mom, you don't know what that person's going to use that money for, and, and maybe you could even be t being taken advantage of right now. My mom politely heard me out, and she simply waited for me to be done. And then when I was done, she looked at me and simply said, Peter, sometimes it's worth being taken advantage of in order to do the right thing. And in that moment, my mom was teaching me, at times, Peter, the heart, the motive, 
is the most important thing to get, not just the action, but the heart behind the action is what is most important in life. There's a study that took a poll of the, all the generations currently in our world today and how, how each one of them live out generosity. And it surveyed a charitable giving through all the generations. And here's the most intriguing thing that I found in that study. The oldest generation, which is the generation that my mom is in, um, they, they were outgiven by a, a few previous generations total-wise. But if you dive into the details, into the stats, they're giving per household, the giving per yearly income, it beats all of the other generations. Like, they get it. They understand what it means to live a generous life, to give the most I can possibly give, to be as generous as possible. You know what demographic makes up a large part of that generation? Widows. They're so generous. They understand where joy comes from. They understand where peace comes from. They understand where stability and security comes from, and they give with joyful hearts. And when we look at the widow, we're inspired to move our hearts towards love and compelled to live incredibly generous lives. I mean, when we really look at that text, I see a few things that that our hearts move from a religious place of giving, and they move to a place that's founded in love and in joy. You see, religion gives from surplus, but love gives from sacrifice. You see, when I give from surplus, it's pretty easy to give from the excess of my life. I mean, I'm not really going to miss it anyway, so why don't I just give it over to God? But when I give out of a place of sacrifice, sacrifice takes thought. It's weighty. But it brings so much joy and so much peace. You see, religion says to give for recognition, but love says to give from humility. When I give for recognition's sake, it's like I'm saying I need to be loved by others, so I need to show them how generous my heart really is. But when I'm motivated by humility, I know that I'm already in a place where I'm completely content in how much God loves me. And that's where I give from. Everything I have is from him, and it's for him. You see, religion also says that I give out of obligation, but love says I give in response. When I give out of obligation, I give because it's what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I wouldn't want God to be mad at me really at the end of the day. But when I give in response, in response to what God has done, I give because God gave first. Living into his generosity brings so much joy into my life. And so my question for you today is this. Where do you want to give from? Where do you want to live from? And how generous do you want to be? I had the privilege of starting a church here in the city we're filming in right now. It actually is eight years this week that we celebrate the starting, the launch of a church here in my community. And while we were getting ready to launch and having pre-gathering meetings, A family friend uh, called me up and said, your mom told me what you guys are doing. I'm so excited to hear that you're starting a church. I would love to be able to give a gift. And then she proceeded to say, I don't care how you use that gift. You can use it for the church if you want for the launch. And then she said, you can also use it for your family. If it would be a blessing to you and your wife and your kids, by all means, keep that gift. And we were like, wow, that's so generous. Thank you. And so we waited for Uh, this gift to come in the mail, and the envelope came. It was addressed from our friend in Portland, Oregon. And as we opened the gift, it was a check for $1,000. Which for our family, that's significant. Uh, Launching a church in December also meant we were going right into Christmas, which $1,000 for our family would actually make for a great December, a great Christmas for our kids and for our family. And while I'm looking at the check, my wife Heather looks at me and says, What are you thinking we should do with it? And I paused and thought for a second, and I just thought, the Lord put on my heart, we're supposed to give it to the church. That's the most important thing that we've called to be a part of in this season. And so not reluctantly, but with joy in our hearts, we gave that gift to the launching of the church. In the last pre-launch meeting before we started the church in December, 
one of our members that helped launch uh, the church in our, in our community came up with an envelope. And it was thick. You could tell there was, there was stuff in it. it was, you know, it's that, that kind of envelope where you go, I, I know what's in there. It's probably cash. And so I, I put it in my bag and saved it for later when we got home. And when I got home, I, I called my wife into our bedroom and I said, I need to show you something. And I pulled out the envelope and she said, what's that? And I said, someone gave this to us a day. And they said, this was a gift for our family for Christmas. And we sat there on the bed as we counted out in cash. $2,000. And with tears in our eyes, we were reminded of how generous and how good our God is. I mean, think about all the generosity moments just in that story. Our friend in Oregon sends a check because she's excited about the gospel going around the world. And she lives out the generosity that God has put on her hearts. In the while, and while we're receiving that gift from her, our hearts are then inspired to continue in that generosity and give that to the launching of the church. And while that's taking place, God is putting it on the heart of someone else to still say, no, Peter, Heather, I've got you. And God showed up in generosity one more time and blessed us and showed us where our confidence is, showed us where our hope is found. And when we live generous lives, we can live in complete security and in complete peace, knowing that God has us. And look at me today. You might be in a place right now where you're wondering, I don't know if God has me. Does God have me right now? And I want you to hear clearly, he's got you. He has you. Don't be robbed of living a generous life. Step into the generosity that God has called us all to. Continue to give so much good away and watch how God will continue to prove faithful in your life time and time again. And as we give joyfully, we don't have to live in the spirit of getting anymore. We can live in the spirit of the gospel, which says to give. Today, that's our response. To live lives of generosity. To put love into action. To give like Jesus gave to us. And so today, it's simple. Maybe some of you are wondering, well, how, sh how should I live out generosity right now? Well, it's, it's Christmas. It's December. Simple thing is, be as generous as you can to your family, to your friends, to those around you. And maybe some of you are like, oh, what else, Peter? Well, how about you meet a need? How about you go to outrageouschristmas.com and bless someone in your community? Or maybe it's even someone that doesn't even live near you. You get to be an anonymous blessing from the Lord that takes care of a family in the Christmas season. I encourage you to do that and step into the joy that God has for you. Maybe some other you, others of you are saying, I want to kind of begin to experience this generous life. How would I do that? Well, how about we go back to that living on 90? What if you began to live as generously as possible and said, what if I lived on the 90 that God has so generously gave me, gave, given to me, and what if I give the rest away? Or maybe some of you would say, I'd love to give an end-of-the-year gift and begin to experience, maybe for the first time, what it feels like and what it looks like to live into the generosity that God has for us. Let's give good away this Christmas. Let's not be deterred by what the world is showing us around us by getting. Let's do what the gospel compels us to do and give so much away. In the film, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey is constantly looking for the purpose of his life, not realizing that it's already around him. It's just not the purpose that he was thinking of. And as if you look at the film, there's a, there's a special moment where George looks at a photo of his father. And underneath that photo, it simply says this, all that you can take with you is that which you have given away. It's that which you have given away. And that, my friend, is moving your heart towards love and towards the generosity that God has for you. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I just thank you today. I thank you for the generosity you've poured out into my life. You're so good. You're so faithful. And I pray that in this Christmas season that you would remind our hearts of how good you are, how generous you've been, and how faithful you've been to us over the years. But maybe there's still some who maybe haven't experienced or think they've experienced that faithfulness.
that generosity in your life. I pray this Christmas season you would show yourself to them real, in a real tangible way. You would care for them. You would meet their needs. You would be present in their lives, and they would know that you are close, that you're with us. Jesus, we pray that as we, we've looked at the story of this generous widow, that our hearts would be compelled to live as generously as possible. Not just to live from the excess of our life or give from the excess of our life, but to give sacrificially where we find joy, peace, and love that compels us to take the gospel all throughout the world, throughout our lives, that our lives would, would exude generosity through giving and that we would step into your joy, step into your life. Ultimately, God, we can't say thank you enough for your generosity for us and that you've given so much to us. We merely want to reflect your generosity that you're showering down over all of humanity, over all of creation. We live into that generosity today. We love you. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Merry Christmas.